right. I wasn't gone very long, was I? So today we have the privilege of this campus is what, eight years old? Almost nine? Be nine at Easter. And uh, Pastor Rodney and Kate, he'll talk about his family here in a second. Um, nine years ago, came to Mustang, Oklahoma, met with uh, the pastor at our Mustang campus. Uh, his name is Dad. Uh, his name is Pastor McNabb. He was my dad. He, pastor Dad is what I've always called him. It's fine. Don't worry about that. But he met with my dad over there, and they both had a heart to start a new campus. And they partnered together, and eight years ago, this campus began in the Will Rogers Theater, and it moved down here. And you guys are all here because of the work that Pastor Kelly, Pastor Rodney and Kate put in. Many of you were a part of that team. And you're still here. Congratulations, and thank you. <laughs> because I couldn't. I'm going to say this right now. There's no way this church would exist without Pastor Rodney and Kate. I could not have done what they did. Planting a church is, to me, it's like magic. I don't know how to do it. It's impossible. Um, that's not my thing. It's not what the Lord called me to do. But I have high regard for men and women who do that. And I love it because Rodney is a man of character. He's going to share a great word today. Pastor Rodney, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate all that you did. You were just telling me, man, you guys got a great team. And a lot of that team is in place because of you and Kate. So thank you so much. We honor you. We appreciate you. Would you please welcome with me Pastor Rodney Wardwell. Good morning. Thanks, Pastor Brian. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for that introduction this morning. We'll, um, I'll say a few things to you here in just a moment. Um, man, it's so good to be here. It's so good to see you. I was going to tell you, some of you look a lot better now than you did when I saw you last. I'm just saying, like, wow, it's so good to see you. Um, love the excitement in the room, and um, I'm so thankful to be with you. I, I can't describe to you the kind of the emotions uh, and the roller coaster I've been on this week, uh, flying in on Friday, uh, driving here to the campus, staying across the street. So, um, But just uh, the flood of emotions, Pastor Brian, and the memories, so many amazing and incredible memories of what God has done over the last many years. Um, and so good to be here. So good to see you. As I look around the room and see faces, I just, I'm just i thinking of stories instantly of what God has done. And, uh, and I'll say some of you I don't know, and I'm so thankful that you're here. So thankful that um, the, you know, the vision that God had for us is, was even bigger than, than us, right? And, and you're a part of that, and you're here. And, um, and so thank you. I want to say thank you to Pastor Brian for uh, the opportunity to speak um, you know, you talk about church planning being magic. It's, it's ironic. I get to work with the National Office for Church Planning, and I still don't know what I'm doing. So, um, but, uh, and, and we're gluttons for punishment because we're still planting churches, right? But um, I'm just, uh, I, again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for literally, literally allowing me to pass the baton to you uh, almost three years ago. And um, I just, from a distance, have been cheering you on, celebrating what God's doing here in Bricktown, what God's doing through your leadership. And, um, and so I'm just so thankful, um, so thankful that uh, you're able to take now the, the bridge in Bricktown places we couldn't. So thank you so much for what you're doing, for your team, for Pastor Kelly, uh, for the entire staff. We love you guys. Um, uh, I, I want to say hello to you from uh, some people who asked me to say hello, um, and I've got a picture here. It's actually an older picture. The reason I want you to know that is because my son's actually taller than mom now, um, and he's really proud of that fact. So, um, But uh, that's my wife, Kate. Uh, she's my right hand, um, been in, in full-time ministry with me now uh, from day one. We just celebrated 22 years of marriage. Yeah. And... Um, 
that's uh, a testimony of her faithfulness, right, putting up with me. Um, she's awesome. And, um, and so uh, she just, she's a, a graphic designer, works for churches across the country. And uh, once we moved to, uh, to Seattle, her business has a- absolutely exploded. And so I'm proud of her. Um, our two children, Kirsten is our oldest. She's 19 now. Um, many of you won't believe this. She's a sophomore in college. Uh, she is a, a UW Husky. Go Huskies. And, um, and so uh, she's also now dating someone who is six foot five. So uh, pray for me. It's a new season, right? As a dad, I'm learning some new things um, and praying a lot more, Pastor Brian, pr- praying a lot more. So uh, but he's a good guy, and, um, and so we, we love him. Um, our, our son, Ryan, is, is 14. And uh, still uh, very much a boy, loves soccer, loves video games, loves the Seattle Mariners. And um, so that's a, a way to, to, to know how to pray for us too. Um, but uh, he, he's fun-loving, loves to entertain, and um, we think our kids are pretty amazing. Um, and so, uh, again, Pastor Brian told uh, some of our story. It really goes back. We spent 14 years in full-time youth ministry at first. That's really where we first met Pastor Brian. And, um, and uh, you know, after that, we felt God calling us to, to move here and plant. And uh, as you said, really, it's one of the hardest things we've ever done. Uh, it's one of the most rewarding things we've ever done. Uh, and uh, I just say this, you are forever a part of our, our story. And so um, we celebrate that. Today we do live um, in Seattle, Washington. And um, the church that we planted was, the idea was uh, in 2014, the pastor said, we're going to plant a campus and then we're going to, for the next five years, plant an additional campus. And so the vision was five campuses in five years. <laughs> and those of you that planted this with us know how crazy that is, right? How ambitious that is. And, um, and so New Hope actually is a year older. New Hope launched uh, in, uh, on Easter Sunday in 2014. So they're one uh, year older and um, be celebrating our 10th year this year. Um, but man, God has just done some amazing things. Uh, the vision that God gave Jeffrey Portman uh, to, as he planted that church, um, uh, we're just excited. God's done some great things. Uh, since we've been there, we've been able to see um, a, a lot of people say yes to Jesus. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, in the Pacific Northwest, when people say yes to Jesus, they're counting the cost and, um, and truly making a commitment um, to follow after, uh, after the Lord. And so um, we've, when it, we were able to open a school of ministry uh, uh, which has been really exciting for us. It's our pipeline uh, as we plant churches. Uh, we're raising up our own kids pastors, youth pastors, worship pastors. And, um, and so we, we're excited. We, uh, it, it's been a while for us. That when you talk about a church who planted five campuses in five years, um, and then we've come and we're there for three years and we haven't planted yet, uh, it kind of feels like, oh, the, the new guy's slow, right? He's, he's, but we're really excited. We have a, a resident planter on our staff right now who's training with us. And and, um, and so uh, in September of next year, one year from this month, uh, we'll be launching out the seventh campus of, of New Hope. And so we're excited about that. God's writing a, an exciting story um, in what, what's happening there. Um, but I, now that I live in a state that has mountains, uh, I really, I have grown to love the outdoors. And um, I don't know if some of you uh, follow my social media, then you've seen that I, I've been climbing mountains recently. And um, it's interesting, I, I didn't know this until I moved there, but uh, Washington has five volcanic mountains. Uh, they're all dormant, but they're all active volcanoes. Uh, so that basically means that at any time they could blow, right? Um, and so it's just fun to know that we live real close to that. Um, but uh, recently I just summited Mount Adams. This is 12,000 feet. Um, last year I had the privilege of doing uh, Mount Rainier, which is the second tallest mountain in the lower 48. It's a technical climb. In fact, there's a picture I wanted to show you of this, of me uh, going across the bridge uh, of a crevasse there. And um, it's, uh, it, that'll test your faith too. Uh, um, and, and some of you know me and you know my story. You know that I love to do adventure stuff really to raise money for missions like Pastor Brian's so passionate about Fire Bible. Um, I love that and love what God's doing um, through you all through fi- to raise money for Fire Bible. And, um, and so we, I, I uh, have been raising funds for a, a group called Atlas Free. And the mission of Atlas Free is... Uh, to see everyone live free uh, and to end sex trafficking. And so I would say this, I don't see myself as much of a mountain climber as I am really an activist, right? And so we have this tagline, we say this all the time, we do what we love to fight what we hate. 
and that's climbing. You know, we enjoy climbing. We love climbing because ultimately we want to see trafficking ended. And so that's that's why uh, we climb. And um, and so I just I say all that to to say. Um, I've been known to do some crazy things, right? Um, several years ago in 2013, I had the privilege to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro. That's really kind of where I got the bug. And, um, and so it just kind of write about, uh, I wrote about some, uh, some unthinkable things, some things that God has called us to do. And I just wanted you to know, I wrote a book uh, that released last year and um, there's some copies back there available. I didn't come to sell books today. I, I brought this to you all because I figured some of you may enjoy this because it talks a lot about Brid- the Bridge Brick Town and our story. Uh, and so you may want to, uh, to grab that if you want. They'll be at the back. Kirsty will be there afterwards. But um, you know, when you tell people though that you're gonna climb mountains, that you're going to run marathons, that you're gonna ride a bicycle for long distances, people look at you crazy. They look at you um, like you've, you know, you're gonna do something, uh, like, like grow a third arm or something like that, right? They just kind of look at you weird. And, um, and, and I know I don't, probably don't have to tell you this, but we live in a world full of people who do crazy things, right? One of, one of my favorite stories is about a guy by the name of Larry Walters. Larry Walters, you may have heard about him if you've uh, uh, read his story o- online or something. But back in 1982, he, he had this dream. He always wanted to fly. But because, he, uh, because of his eyesight, the, the military never allowed him to become a pilot. And, um, and so he, he did in his mind what he thought was the next best thing. And he went to the Army surplus store. He got 43 helium balloons he filled them with helium. He tied them to a metal lawn chair. He thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to grab uh, a lunch. I'm going to make myself a few sandwiches. I'll take my BB gun with me. I'll fly up into the air, shoot the balloons down after I'm done eating my lunch, you know, after I look around for a little bit. Uh, and and then, I'll, then I'll be able to say I've, I've flown. I've been able to see what, uh, you know, what the military didn't allow me to do. And so that's exactly what he did. He strapped himself. He tied his chair down, strapped himself down, uh, put the helium balloons on it cut the cord, and he shot up in the air 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet. And the the story is a true story that it was two airline pilots who saw him and radioed into the tower. Could you imagine what that was like hearing a... Uh, Flight control, we have a guy in a lawn chair. (laughs) This is the tower. Could you repeat that, please? Right... And so there he was, 15,000 feet in the air. Safely, he got himself back down. And as you can imagine, as he landed, the police were there to greet him, (laughs) to handcuff him, to take him away. But you know what? As I heard that story, I was like, I kind of respect a little bit a guy who's crazy enough, who has a dream to do something like that, right? As, As strange as it was. And over the years, when I tell people that I'm going to climb a mountain, a lot of times they look at me like I'm Larry Walters, right? And, um, but to me, it's just who I am. It's just what I like to do. Uh, it doesn't feel unthinkable to me because it's who I am. And over the years, I've had this revelation that, uh, that we have this incredibly big God, a God who does the unthinkable, right? Ephesians 3.20 says, To him who's able to do immeasurably abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church forever and ever. And you know, he's the God of the unthinkable. And because he is the God of the unthinkable, because you and I are his people, then you and I are called to do the unthinkable as well. The truth is, he wants to do the unthinkable in your life, but he also wants to do the unthinkable through your life. And can I just tell you something that might challenge some of you today as you hear this, but you were made to do the unthinkable. In fact, I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them, God has called you to do the unthinkable. Tell them. That's right. God has called you to do the unthinkable. Now, here's the thing. I, I, I had you tell your neighbor that because it's really easy to tell someone else that. It's a lot easier for me to believe that about you than it is for that to actually believe, for me to believe that about myself. So can you tell yourself that? God has called me to do the unthinkable, and I believe that for you today. Maybe you, maybe you don't believe in yourself. Maybe you feel like you've made too many mistakes in your life. Maybe you feel like you know, God can have plans for other people but it's too late for me. I want to share with you a message today that I hope will shake some of those doubts, some of those insecurities that you might wrestle with. And so this morning, uh, if you have your Bible, we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. You can turn there if you want. I believe it'll be on the screen. You could follow that way. And we're going to begin in verse 1. And this is what it says. 
It says, then they, they being Jesus and his disciples, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountain, so all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now we'll pause there in the story. We'll come back to it and look uh, at it a little bit further in in just a moment. But I know what you're thinking. (laughs) Why did he come here talking to us about a demon-possessed guy, right? I, I, I want you to know, first of all, I'm not an authority on, on that, okay? Um, but you're thinking, too, what, how does this story really relate to me? How does it relate to my life? And the question I want us to really look through today is, what does God want me to know about my story? What does God want you to know about your story? And this morning, I want to give you three truths that we learn about Jesus here that will reveal to us what God is trying to say to us. Uh, the first thing I want you to see, number one, is that Jesus isn't afraid to step into dark places, Jesus isn't afraid to step into dark places. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, the story tells us, pulls up uh, into this place called Gadara, and it's, where it's at is modern-day Jordan on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And at that time, it, it was a place where many Gentiles or many non-Jewish believers were living. And, and the first thing that Jesus and his followers encounter as they come to shore is this crazy guy. He comes out of the tombs, and he's wearing broken chains, and he's, he's bleeding because he's been cutting himself. And so we learn about this guy that, uh, you know, that everyone's afraid of him. Nobody, we, we don't really know his name, uh, and we, we never really find out his name, but he's been outcasted. He's living out in the catacombs, living on the outskirts of town, because people are absolutely afraid of him and who he is. And we find out he's being tormented by, by demons. And the people of this town are absolutely wigged out by him. They've banished him. And so Jesus and his disciples, they come to town and they come to the shore and they get out of their boat and immediately this guy approaches them. And here's what we notice. Jesus isn't phased by him at all. Jesus isn't afraid of him. Unlike the rest of the people in Gadara, this guy does not intimidate Jesus. And today I want you to know that whatever you're going through, wherever you are, it doesn't intimidate Jesus. Jesus is not afraid or intimidated about your situation. Many of us come from dark places. Uh, you know, I live in Seattle where depression is rampant, where homelessness and drug abuse is on the rise, and more and more people are dealing with confusion over their identity and their sexuality. And I don't like to ever give the enemy credit, uh, and, but we can't deny that challenges are on the rise. And I, I would like to think that, you know what, hey, because we're the church, we're immune to that, right? We, we don't have the attacks of the enemy on our lives any, anymore as we're followers of Jesus, but that's not the case, right? We still have to walk through some of the same things. Uh, you know, uh, I was even thinking just about our own family. As a kid, my wife walked through the darkness of, of divorce. Uh, as a family, we've walked through some of, of, of the challenges that come with, with mental health. We've experienced physical attacks. We've experienced attacks as church planters that have been spiritual. And, um, and possibly many of you have experienced some of those thing, same things in your life. But I want you to know, whatever you're going through and whatever you're facing, know that it does not intimidate Jesus. Jesus is not afraid to move into dark places. And when he shows up, he drives the darkness out. And so back to our passage, Jesus shows up on the shore and he confronts the spirit that's, that's possessing this crazy man. And Jesus casts those demons out and they go into pigs and, and those pigs run down into the Sea of Galilee and drown. And uh, I just want to point out this happens because the enemy always wants to bring destruction. The enemy was like, listen, okay, we'll come out of the man, but you got to let us at least kill something. You gotta at least let us destroy something. Scripture says in John 10:10, 10, 10, the enemy's motive is to steal, kill, and to destroy. 
And so they're like, let us at least kill something. And so uh, Jesus allows them to go into the pigs and they run into the sea and they drown. But Jesus steps up in the moment and he doesn't back down from the enemy. And I want you to know that he'll show up in your life and he'll show up in your situation as well. When you call on Jesus, he shows up. He's not afraid of what you're facing. When you call on him, he'll come and he'll walk with you. And I just believe somebody needed to be encouraged with that this morning. The second truth that we see about Jesus in our story, number two, is that Jesus is still transforming lives. Now, I want to tell you a story about a, a guy named Ryan. Ryan is a software engineer in, in Seattle. He develops video games for a living. And um, for the last couple of years, Ryan was working next to a guy uh, who attends New Hope. His name is Victor. Uh, they work together. And Ryan was a, a staunch atheist. Victor is a, a, a follower of Jesus. And, and they, the two of them became friends. They had this working relationship. Uh, and it was kind of one of those things where Victor was going to say, hey, I'm going to continue to tell you about Jesus. And Ryan's like, great, but I'm going to continue to not believe. And that was kind of their relationship. And they still were friends. And um, you know, what happened, obviously COVID happened, and the two of those guys wound up working from home quite a bit. Eventually, Victor and his family decided, hey, we can keep doing this and live in Arizona. So they moved with their family to Arizona. So fast forward two years to this past March, um, we find out Victor gets a call from his friend Ryan, and he says to Victor, he says, hey, um, I, I, I need you to pray for me. I need you to help me here. He's like, I I've got this girl, we're engaged, we're gonna get married. But he's like, something's going on in her life and I don't know how to describe it. He's like, I'm an atheist and I don't believe, but there's something spiritual happening. There's something weird happening and I, I don't know what to do about it. And so he, he uh, Victor says, here's what you need to do. You need to take her and go to New Hope on Sunday. And I'm like, thanks, right? Thanks, thanks so much. Sunday morning rolls around, Ryan and we knock, they come, and it's a 9.30 gathering, and I preach, I give the altar call, and she comes forward, and they're praying, and there's apparently uh, some things happening as, as she's being prayed for. And, um, and so the, the team, our elders come around them, and they begin to pray for them, and they move to a place where, because uh, we're about to start our second gathering, and uh, not that we're ashamed of what God's doing, but like when People are coming in to church for the, for the gathering and they don't have any context of what was going on. We thought it might be a little bit distracting. And so they take her and they begin to pray with her in our prayer room and, um, and they begin to share the gospel with her and share the gospel with Ryan. And, uh, and so as a pastor, I was so thankful for elders that knew how to pray because I had to preach the next gathering. We stopped and we, we prayed for them. But it was so awesome when I came off the platform, I walked out the back doors. At the end of the gathering, I saw Ryan and Weena walking out with smiles on their faces, with clear eyes. This atheist had said yes to Jesus. His fiance had said yes to Jesus and was set free. And I share that story with you today to say this, that, that Jesus is still transforming lives. But the story gets even better because it was uh, on May the 5th. I got a couple pictures. This first picture on May the 5th, we were able to marry uh, uh, Ryan and, and Weena in the lobby of our church. But it was a great weekend because two days later, we also got to baptize them both as they went public in their faith. And so it was just so cool to see what God ha has done in their lives and just be reminded he's still transforming lives, right? Um, in verse 14 of our passage, it says this, that those who fed the swine fled and they told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was that had happened. And then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. So word starts to spread that something happened when Jesus and his disciples came to town, right? That this madman that they had outcasted to the catacombs, that something happened to him. In fact, you can imagine that the hired hands rushed home to tell their, their boss that the, the 2,000 pigs were dead, right? And so, uh, well, tell us what happened. Why did that happen? And so, people began to come out to see what was happening there. And when they saw this man with their own eyes, they were absolutely blown away that this man who once scared them, who was out of control, was sitting there. He was civil. He was carrying on a conversation. In fact, in verse 15, it says these words, he was in his right mind. He was in his right mind, transformed into a different person. And I just want you to know that when, when Jesus shows up, things happen. When you encounter the power of God in your life, 
transformation is supposed to be what follows, right? Uh, When you encounter Jesus, you start living in a way that people notice the change, the way that you love others unconditionally, the way that you forgive more easily, the way that you give generously, the way you persevere through things fearlessly, the way you serve sacrificially, the way you start to dream dreams and do big things with your life. The work of God is noticeable. This transformation takes place and people begin to look at your life and they think, man, that's unthinkable that you would do that. Jesus brings transformation. And the last thing that I want you to see is Jesus is writing stories that need to be told. I'll share a couple more stories with you real quick. Um, Shannon Leatherwood is a middle school administrator. Um, she's been attending New Hope uh, since the, the pandemic kind of came um, to, uh, to an end as things started to kind of get back to normal more. And, um, and uh, just an amazing family. And she told me a couple of weeks ago that the school that she is the administrator for is uh, 95% of the students are living under the poverty level. Uh, 700 students, 6th through 8th grade. And, um, and she said that in 2022, um, she was coming to New Hope, and our theme for the year was unthinkable. We actually did a church-wide theme. Everyone got a copy of the book. Uh, there's a small group study. Our children's ministry went through unthinkable. It was an entire uh, family focus that we did. And, um, and she was there, and she said um, that uh, just God really began to speak to her heart in that moment to see that she wasn't just working out of school, but that was actually her mission field that that was where her purpose was. That's where God had called her. And, uh, and it began to impact the way that she led her staff. It began to impact the way that her staff connected with their students. In fact, I, I know that it impacted her staff because some of her staff started coming to church. Um, and it was this last school year, 22-23, um, that the school scored the second highest uh, state testing of all middle school students. Um, in fact, uh, it was such a drastic change from the previous year that the school district in Washington said it was the biggest improvement in one calendar year for any state testing for any students. And, and here's why I'm sharing this with you. I found out recently Shannon was awarded the middle school administrator of the year for the state of Washington. And I didn't know this until we had a conversation. She said, she said do you know what our theme for our school was this year? And I I had no idea. And she said, our theme was do the unthinkable with your life and dream big. And she said, I get to go to Washington, D.C. this fall and I get to speak uh, with all of the other winners of uh, the state middle school administrators uh, in D.C. And she said, I'm going to be telling them to do the unthinkable as well. And so I want you to know Jesus is writing stories that still need to be told right? One of my favorites, one of the most recent stories is about a lady named Danielle. Um, Danielle is a barista at the Starbucks that's closest to our church. Now, Starbucks has a huge presence where we live. In fact, there's a, in a three-mile span, I think, five Starbucks from our church. And so um, it's, it's the headquarters, right? And, um, and so uh, the Starbucks that's closest to our church is where I like to office out of uh, to meet people, connect with people. And and um, I began to get to know Danielle, and we began to talk about her story a little bit. She began to share me about uh, her life and background and things. And at one, one day, I just really felt like the Lord uh, was laying on my heart to kind of have one of those, like, I see this in you moments. And I asked her, I said, can I share something with you that as this common Joe who sits over here at this table uh, and just kind of watches what goes on, can I tell you an observation I've made? And she's like, absolutely. I said, I said, I think uh, as I watch what you're doing, uh, I, I see in you like this discouragement of someone who's middle age and you think this is all I'm doing with my life. But I want you to know, I've watched you pour into young adults who come to work here and you're teaching them way more than how to make coffee. And you're, you're you know, living out your purpose. You're making an impact here. And, uh, and she thanked me for that. And um, a couple, couple weeks later, I went back in and we, we were talking and, and she said, you know, I think I'm gonna come and visit your church someday. And I said, hey, we'd love for you to do that. There's no expectation, but I'd love to host your family. I'd love for you to come. And um, so Daniel did come and she started bringing her family. She started bringing friends. And on Easter Sunday this past year, I got this card slid across my desk and said, Daniel Mark, she gave her life to Jesus. Yeah, and I was so excited because just a couple of weeks ago, here's a picture, I got to baptize my barista. And uh, I am so excited. <laughs> Jesus is still writing stories that need to be told. And here's the thing, I know you, I know many of you, I know some of your stories. You need to tell your story. God's done some incredible things here at Bricktown. He's done some incredible things through you, and you have a story that needs to be told. 
And so we look back at our text, and as we conclude here this morning in verse 18, there's something that happens in the story I never thought I'd ever see Jesus do, but he actually tells somebody not to follow him. And let's look at it in verse 18. And when Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus didn't permit him, but he said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. So the demon-possessed man, he comes to Jesus and he says, hey, I, I wanna follow you. And Jesus says, no, you can't follow me. In fact, Jesus says these words, Jesus did not permit him. Now, it, it makes sense why this guy would wanna follow Jesus. His life has been completely changed but Jesus says, no, why? What's, what's the big deal? But I believe it's this. I believe Jesus knew that this man's story would have a greater impact right where he was than anywhere else. It makes total sense, right, that he would want to go with Jesus. But Jesus said, no, I need you to stay here. I need you to be a witness right here. I need you to be a witness right here in this community, right here in Gadara. And so word began to spread. People began to come and hear when they showed up and they saw this man sitting and having a conversation, could you imagine what they were thinking? Hey, doesn't that look like the guy who used to live in the catacombs? And now he's over there drinking his mocha, right, at the local Starbucks. What's going on? I need to go find out more about this story. And some of you think, man, if God would just call me to China, if God would just call me to Africa, if he would just call me this place or that place, then I could really make a difference with my life for Jesus. But the reality is you can have a greater impact in your community here in Oklahoma City. It would be even greater because the people who knew you before Jesus are now going to know you after you've been set free by Jesus, and they're going to notice the change that's in your life. The story that God is writing and all that he's done in your life is a story that needs to be told because in your end, your story brings some glory. And something that happens when you take transformation that's happened through the blood of Jesus and, and partner that with the Holy Spirit, then the Lord will give you a boldness and a passion to be his witness, right? The Bible says in Acts 1.8, Jesus told his disciples, he said, after that, the Holy Spirit will come on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so, friends, your story needs to be told. People need to hear your testimony of what God has done in your life. And the beautiful thing is, is that then he gives us his Holy Spirit to embolden us, to help us to be able to communicate that story. What does God want you to know about your story today? He wants you to know that if you'll let him, he can use your story to, to make an incredible impact in the lives of others. He wants to do the unthinkable through you. Team, would you, would you go ahead and come and prepare to, to lead us in our time of response this morning? As they do that, I want you to look at one last verse with me in verse 17. And I want you to notice that people were begging and pleading Jesus to leave the region, right? They were, the scripture says they were so wigged out by what had happened to this man who was once demon-possessed and how he was transformed and changed so dramatically that it scared them and they asked Jesus to leave. Just take your disciples, get in the boat and leave. The farmers were obviously upset that their livestock had been killed just get in the boat and leave. They were, con they were confused. So Jesus and his disciples, they get in the boat, they go across the lake, they do ministry, they go to some other cities. It's uh, on this next leg of the journey, Jesus heals Jairus' daughter, he heals the woman who has the issue of bleeding. Uh, he goes to his hometown, to the synagogue, he sends out the 12, he feeds the 5,000, he does all these things. And then, then we find out that Jesus goes back to the Decapolis in Mark chapter 8. He goes back to this region, and there's more to this story. But this time, while Jesus heads that way, possibly just a few months later, a revival has broken out. People are being healed. People are being set free. People are coming from all over the region. And it makes us ask, why would this group of people who chased Jesus out later welcome him back and ask him to stay and minister? You've heard the story of the feeding of the 5,000. There was also a feeding of the 4,000, and that's where this takes place. There are so many people coming to sit under Jesus' teaching, to be uh, prayed for, for the hands to be laid on them so they could be set free. And Jesus is concerned that many of them have gone so long without food because they've been there just pursuing a move of God in their lives. And, and the question is, how could a community go from get in your boat and get out of here to 
we don't even care about food. We want what you have so desperately and we want to move of God so desperately. And the only thing I can think of is that there was a madman who had been set free, who had been commissioned by Jesus to go back to his community and tell his story. Mark 5 and verse 19, Jesus said, go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. Go back and tell your story. And that's exactly what he did. And his testimony was a catalyst for a move of God in the region. And I want to challenge you today to live your life in a way that looks unthinkable to the people around you. Live your life as someone who's been transformed by the power of Jesus. In fact, I can, if I can be so bold to say this, if you're living a life that isn't unthinkable, then you're living a life that's unnoticeable. And the problem with that is that then no one is noticing the Jesus that's in you. And so what story do you need to go and share? What do you need to go and who do you need to go to and tell your story? This week I wanna challenge you to tell of the God who does the unthinkable. He did it for the man in our story. He'll do it through you with the help of his Holy Spirit. He's not afraid to step into dark places. He still transforms lives and he's still writing stories that need to be told. Your story needs to be told. I'm gonna ask you this morning, would you close your eyes? And I just wanna, I wanna give a couple of takeaways and some direction for us in our response time. Maybe you're here today and maybe you'd say, first of all, for me, I'd like to begin a relationship with Jesus. Jesus went to the cross to die for your sins, to forgive you, to restore purpose back to you. And maybe you'd say that I I don't have a relationship with him. I love nothing more than the opportunity today than to be able to pray and help you say yes to Jesus. If that's you, I wanna lead in a prayer. You can pray this, you can pray something like this with me. Jesus, today, I wanna begin a relationship with you. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for me. I want to spend eternity with you. I confess that you're my Lord and my Savior, and I invite you into my life. And I ask that you would lead me and guide me, help me. I want to live my life with purpose for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. With your eyes closed for just a moment, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to call you forward, make you stand, anything like that. But just if you'd say, Pastor, that was me. I, I said yes to Jesus today. I prayed with you. I invited Christ into my life today, you'd say, that's me. you just slip a hand up, put it right back down. That's me. Maybe this morning for you, the, the takeaway is you'd say, you know what, I've said yes to Jesus, but I'm not really sure that I've allowed him to transform my life. There's some things in my life that I need his help with and I want, I want, to, I want to grow. I wanna see that transformation take place. Maybe you'd say the takeaway for me is, I'm challenged this morning to share my story. And I need the Holy Spirit's boldness to help me to do that. I wanna make a difference. I want to live out my life in a way that looks unthinkable to people who are unbelievers. I wanna live for Jesus with a passion. I don't know where this message lands with you, but we're gonna take some time, Pastor Kelly and the team are gonna lead us and we're gonna worship the Lord and, and respond to him this morning. And I'll just say this, if at, at any point you need prayer for anything, I'd love to pray with you. I'll be here. And team, we have a prayer team that will come. Prayer team would love to come and pray and be a part as well this morning uh, and, and just encourage you. So at this time, can we stand? Let's stand this morning. Let's worship, let's respond. Let's take some time to worship the Lord. Amen. can have the prayer team come forward. If you need prayer this morning, we're available to pray with you. If not, let's just worship together. Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God.
Isn't God good? Can we give the Lord praise in this place today? Thank you, Pastor Rodney, for such an encouraging word, a challenging word. Uh, I love that uh, encouragement to go forth. It fits our series so good because it's what the power of the Holy Spirit came to do was to make us witnesses. And too many times we get thinking that the Holy Spirit's about other stuff and we miss it. So gifted. You are gifted to share your story. It's awesome. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, next week, we will continue with the Gifted series. I'll be speaking next weekend. Uh, if, again, today's the first time you've been with us, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We would love for you to stop by Starting Point back there. It looks like Chas and Kirsty are in the house. They are amazing human beings. Do your life a favor and go meet them. Uh, they're great people. Uh, there's a communication card right in front of you. Just fill out the portion of that. What's going to happen, just so you know, like if you give us a way to contact you, like I'm going to call you, and I'm just going to be like, hey, you should come back next time, and uh, just see if you have any questions and how I can serve your family. Um, and then also the way we tithe or give offerings here, those are separate things. The way we do that uh, here at the bridge is either through the app. So if you downloaded the app, you can do that through there. Or if it's your weekend of tithe like it is mine, uh, you can give in the offering boxes on the way out. There's offering envelopes right in front of you. Although I will say I do all mine online and 95, 97% of our giving is online now. So um, good job. Way to go. Uh, you guys are killing it. And uh, we're so grateful for your generosity. Um, first steps is October 1st. If you uh, would like to become a partner with us, we don't do membership really. We become partners together because we're in this, this is a team sport. And I want to invite you. If it's one of the ways, if you're like, I want to start serving, I want to be on a volunteer team, I want to do that kind of thing, we would invite you to first steps. Uh, Pastor Cody oversees that. And that's October 1st, immediately following the service. You could sign up online right now through the app. And uh, we'd love to have you also check out those groups because... We do life together. All right. I love you guys. Cannot wait to share with you next Sunday in Gifted. Uh, find a group this week. Go meet some new people. We love you. God bless you. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you yet, I sure want to. Have a great week, and we'll see you next